Hey, everybody on YouTube and Zoom. We'll get started here in about 60 seconds. Uh, excited to have Josh and Steve on today. Sounds like we got a little feedback here, Dave. You're getting the double. I know, I, yeah, I got it. We're, we're good. I'm a professional, guys. <laughs> Josh, Steve, you guys ready? Ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Just want to uh, welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. We got another great Thursday goaltending day um, for the webinar here with our trusty friend and colleague, ADM manager for goaltending, Steve Thompson, with his new mustache. And uh, another one of our friends from uh, coaching the Florida Everblades, Josh Robinson. Steve, uh, this is all yours. So um, let me know if I can help and I'll be in and out. Awesome, Dave. Thank you. Robo, thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. Uh, for those that don't know, Josh and I had the chance to play together in Sioux City back in 2007, so this is a lot of fun for us to uh, reconnect now on the coaching side of things. So, Josh, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was uh, it was a blast back then, and I and enjoyed catching up last summer, so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's be good. And so, for those that haven't had the chance to meet Josh or work with Josh across the country, uh, has a really unique story with his youth hockey that I wanted to share. And it's actually kind of parallels some of the things that we've heard throughout this webinar series. Um, but as far as your playing career and then to your coaching career, uh, we've had the chance to play together in Sioux City and you were there the year prior to, so that would have been 06 through probably 08. Yes, and yeah, the two years there. From there, went to Michigan Tech for four years, had a five-year pro career, and in 2016 was the East Coast Goalie of the Year. And from that uh, transition into coaching, had the opportunity to start helping out USA Hockey with the Warren Australo camp in, uh, I think it was 18 and 19. And yep. have been with the Florida Everblades and ECHL for the past uh, three, now going on four years. Yeah. So love to uh, chat a little about your youth hockey path. I know that uh, Scott Clements had mentioned in his, uh, you know, he stayed in Des Moines and played high school hockey for a long time. And, and today, as I'm sure you're well aware, a lot of the trends with our parents and our goalies are that, you know, when as soon as 14 year olds come, I better start looking over the fence and see which state I should move to, to make sure I'm playing AAA and all this stuff. So um, were those some of the challenges that you faced in youth hockey and, and kind of what was that career path like for you? Yeah. So I, I grew up in Michigan um, and right about the time the Detroit Red Wings kind of started having success, success in um, 96, 97, 98. Uh, I was like six, seven, eight years old. Um, and I, I started getting into watching them and Chris Osgood. And I told my dad when I was seven years old, I was like, hey, I want to be a goalie. And I had never really skated or, or done anything other than kind of roller hockey before that. Um, so they, we, we were lucky enough to have a rank that opened up 15 minutes away from us uh, in Birch Run, Michigan. Uh, the first year was opening put me into, you know, learn to skate classes and went through those and learned to play. And finally, when I was about eight going on nine, um, I played my first, uh, first season of um, like, you know, rec or, you know, house hockey there as a defenseman. Uh, and I was still uh, set on being a goalie. So finally my second year, so I was like nine or so going on 10, I started playing house as a goalie um, and kind of fast forward a little bit. I went through all minor hockey through, um, up through my 15 into 16 year old year playing A and double A around uh, the Midland Bay City Saginaw area of uh, Michigan. So I never, uh, never really played triple A, never made any of the teams down in Detroit. Um, I was just, you know, doing my thing up there in the, the thumb of Michigan. And, and then finally my uh, 16 year old year, I uh, ended up making for the first time out of our region in uh, Michigan. So there's the eight regions there made it out of that uh, Saginaw region for the first time for the Selects Festival. I went to the Michigan Festival, did really well there, and ended up going to St. Cloud where the Select 17 was. And that was the first time I had really ever um, made it anywhere at a national scale or kind of been noticed. Um, went back to Michigan that season to play in uh, the Sioux for the Sioux uh, Indians midget AAA team. Um, I played six or seven games about a month or a month and a half. And then uh, Sioux City drafted me in the futures draft, which at the time was uh, at the beginning of the season, 
they were unhappy with one of their goaltenders and ended up uh, bringing me up right away that season to back up Jerry Kuhn for that uh, first year. Um, so I, it was unique and kind of a, a, an, a different path from, you know, going playing double A one season, a few games of triple A for about a month and then into the USHL. But uh, it was, it, it, and then down here in Florida, it, it's been something I've stressed with the youth organization is you don't have to, you know, leave. You don't have to be, you know, searching for that next spot. Everyone's path is different. Um, and, and I'm, you know, proof of that is you can make it from, you know, different, uh, different hockey paths. And uh, I, I wouldn't change anything. And I really enjoyed uh, my, my path to, you know, getting into the USHL and, and college and beyond. Yeah, it sounds something similar to what we see, like in, in Las Vegas, for instance, they have a fantastic program and goaltending development program specifically with, but it's only double A. And there's so many families in Vegas that feel like i would got to move to Arizona. If I don't play in the Arizona AAA program, I'm never going to make it. And, um, you know, we're always saying, like, if you're being treated well, if you're being developed well where you're at, you know, stay, get better. You, you, you will find your way. Do you remember having some of those pressures as an athlete or have you talked to your parents about, you know, was that a consideration when you were playing double A or was it just, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to, I'm going to get better. Kind of what was that like for you as an athlete? No, it, it really wasn't. We, I, I don't know if it was, I was just happy with what I was doing. I was having fun. Um, I tried out for a couple of the AAA teams down in Detroit, the Honey Bakes and Bell Tires and whatnot, and I never made the team. So I was, we had a, a really good group of uh, friends and, and teammates that, you know, we had um, a lot of fun and a lot of success. And my, I was like my, my midget A year, we ended up uh, winning the state championship and going to nationals and, and did well out there. So we, we were on, you know, not amazing teams, but we had some success and I was playing a lot of games and it, I, I always knew that I wanted to, you know, go play college hockey. I grew up a Michigan state fan and um, I, I always knew I wanted to play in the NHL obviously, but in, not really until that summer when I, you know, I signed with the, the midget team up in the Sioux and I ended up making the select 17 festivals. I was like, Hey, like, you know, this, this is a path that I really want to follow now is always just kind of trying to get better and, you know, enjoying enjoying what I was doing growing up. I think a couple of fears the parents have, I would say number one is exposure. And I would love to talk to Bobby Kinsella about like, you know, how he found you. Like, how did you get drafted in the futures draft in the double A leagues? Was he, was he searching around there? Like, is there really that myth of not being seen at that level? But I think the other piece would be, you know, not being prepared to play at the highest level, because if you're playing double A hockey, it's not high enough when you got to Sioux City, did you feel like you were behind the eight ball because you'd been playing double A or were you able to transition into, you know, our country's best junior league pretty seamlessly because you developed the way you should have? No, I, I think like, obviously the first practice, I remember just the pace of everything was, you know, it was fast. So I think more than just the pace and adjusting and um, Dave Sisliano, our head coach and Bobby Kinsella, the assistant coach, they, they did a great job just helping me. And I was able to watch Gary Kuhn and, I, I'd have to look back exactly probably about three or four weeks, it was probably about a month before they put me into a game. Uh, I ended up winning my, my first start at home against, uh, against Indiana. And um, by that time, I felt like I was at home on the team. I'd gotten to know the guys and, you know, gotten comfortable with the, the speed and everything in practice. And um, I, I had a pretty good first year. I think I went like eight and eight or so and had decent numbers. And, and I was able to learn a ton from Jerry Kuhn and, you know, and transition that into the next year with yourself as my goalie partner and, um, and kind of took that next step as uh, trying to, be, trying to be a starter. Yeah. And it, I think, you know, one thing we're always stressed with our youth athletes is thrive, not just survive. And, and I think that's probably something that really helped you get to where you were as you were playing in, at a level where you were, you know, playing good hockey, you were confident and that allowed you to, to, to climb the ladder probably a little bit faster than maybe if you would have made a honey baked when you weren't ready yet not played as many minutes or maybe you got shelled a few times and you know who knows where your path would have taken you so definitely some interesting things to talk about and I think another great example of someone not going that very traditional path that all of our goalies and parents think where it's you got to play AAA every year you've got to make sure that you're making selects every summer and if you don't you may as well just hawk, hang up your goalie pad and call it a career. Yeah absolutely and especially you know down here in Florida we only have one triple a program the alliance so there's a lot of goalies and only two at every age level get to make it so by all means like even if you're you're playing where you live and on whatever side of the state there you're always going to develop and play a lot of games and you're never you're never out of it 
Well, now getting into more about uh, the tactical side of the position and, and what we're really here for today is post play. And before we jump into your position or your presentation, I want to talk a little bit about post play in general, because I think this is one of the probably four letter words for goaltending right now. I know when I speak to many coaches that don't have a goaltending background and even some that do, it's like, I don't even know what the VHR is. And, you know, there's a hashtag for RVH fails. And, you know, it just seems to be this very negative piece of our game right now where there's probably a lot of goalie coaches that think, you know, is this, is this actually the way we should be playing this? Like why there's so many cheesy goals going in kind of, where do you sit on this with the post play? Yeah. I, I think overall it's a great thing. I think where we run into issues um, is either misusing the save selection or not fully understanding, you know, when we're supposed to use it or also kind of, I guess, not knowing yourself. I think you, there's, there's so many different ways, but I, I think as a whole, we use these saves to make so many or use these techniques to make so many routine or, you know, easy looking saves that I feel like they get overlooked when we do allow a goal. So it, sometimes it's not, it's not choosing the wrong save selection. It's mis executing what you want to do there, which happens in goaltending all the time because there are goals. And just because we get, we get scored over the glove doesn't mean we're going to change what we do with our glove is, you know, a goal happened. We maybe didn't do what we wanted to do there, but it's not the wrong save selection for that situation. Yeah. I'm excited to kind of dive into that a little bit more with your presentation. And I think another you know message, I'd love to hear your perspective on this, but just for all of our goalie coaches that are out there listening, when we ever do come up with the next goalie term, can we please make it a little more accessible because the term RVH is a little weird. Like what on earth does that even mean? And I've always wished we could change the terms to like post leg up or post leg down and just keep it as simple as possible. So no matter who you are, how long you've been playing the game, or if you've ever even played the game, uh, that everybody understands what that means and what it looks like. But I'll kind of wait for your presentation to dive in a little deeper as to what the, our, you know, our VH even stands for and what it looks like and all that. Perfect. So, all right, well, let's jump into your presentation and talk about post play today. All right. I'll share my screen here. Perfect. All righty. So we will, uh, we will get into things here. So my, my two goals of this presentation, uh, part one is going to be um, talking about the techniques we use, uh, talking about why we use them, and then also when we should properly use them. Because that's uh, those last two things are, you know, very, very key to, to executing them properly in a game. Uh, and then part two is going to be a little bit of a case study. Uh, I had a goaltender named Ken, Ken Appleby this year. Uh, and when he came to me, uh, we had an issue uh, that he he wanted to work on. It wasn't something that he really had a solution to yet. Um, so it was on his uh, his glove side RVH that we uh, we kind of ended up making some changes, and it turned into a, a really good adjustment him, for him throughout the year. So the the three techniques that we're going to talk about today are going to be the overlap, the RVH, which stands for reverse vertical horizontal, and the VH, which stands for vertical horizontal. And I'll, uh, I'll touch on each of those and kind of explain why it's called that and, and why the, the terms have, have kind of come that way. So the first one we'll go over is the overlap. So you can see here, Pekka Rene in the picture. Um, if you look at his left leg and the, the term overlapping actually stands for the post side leg uh, outside the post overlapping in that position. And, and what this allows you to do is you can maintain your angle you can maintain your squareness and your depth on that shot. Uh, your ankle, that outside ankle there, isn't locked up with the post. You're able to, to go down. You're able to push. You're able to move. Uh, it's much more free than putting your, your skate leg inside the post there. Uh, and the coverage of the net is great. And obviously, from this picture, there's nothing to shoot at. And if Pekka were to just stand there, the only place that puck could go in is through his five hole. So he really only has to worry about, you know, going down, not allowing holes and then controlling that rebound from here. The, the things to be aware of uh, from an overlap position are backdoor threats. It's a longer way to go. Uh, it's harder to get that hard push across. And then if a shooter is driving wide with speed and going around you, those are some things that you have to be aware of. Um, when do we use this? Uh, you can see from the diagram there, it, it's for plays whether it's off the rush, um, shots with no backdoor option, but between those two lines there, where I've dri or drawn the line from you know, just above the outside um, face-off hash mark down just above the goal line, 
Um, this is typically where you'll see guys uh, in the NHL, AHL, ECHL, college, you know, all the way down into juniors using the overlap situation. Uh, and it's great for, for net drives as well for guys driving the net from, from those positions. So we're going to go into some clips here. Um, and I'm going to kind of stop it and, and highlight some of the different um, situations and, and uses of the, uh, the overlap here. So this first one, Cam Johnson, uh, one of my goaltenders last year, the play entered wide, drove down the wing into a, a low shooting situation. You can see here that there's no one back door. So Cam does a great job getting his leg free. He's overlapping in a great position here. He's tight. There's no holes. And then he makes a nice save there and keeps the rebound in front of him. And our team's able to, to pick it up and go out the other way. So we'll play it a couple more times here for, for people to watch that. Great situation to use an overlap. Controls the rebound. And then as soon as we get the puck out, you know, he does a good job of getting back to his feet. So that's great. The next one here, we have a net drive where Cam's going to use the overlap. This guy is driving in kind of on a two-on-two. -two. He's going to beat our defense in wide. Cam is going to hold that overlap position. He's nice and athletic. He's low. He's tracking that puck well. The guy cuts in front. He's able to make a save. He stays tight. Nothing underneath him. It's a great job right there. And then obviously the big thing that we stress on is as soon as that puck is cleared, he's getting back to his feet. He's not waiting for things. Everything looks great there. Last one here is kind of a, a combined clip. So Cam is in an, uh, an RVH position, which we'll touch on in a minute here. Puck gets popped low to high. He actually pops out into an overlap position here. And you can see his coverage for, you know, what the puck is there is he's covering the entire net. He gets down, he makes a save. Unfortunately, we're not able to clear the puck, but he has the awareness and the ability to fight through a couple layers of traffic there and slides back door and makes a great save. So we'll kind of watch that again. Pop out right there. Nice overlap save. You can see he immediately got back to his feet. He's looking through a couple layers of traffic here. So we have guy there. We have a kind of a two guys battling in front. And he has the awareness to recognize where this guy is back door. Push back. He targets his post and makes a great glove save. So I left that second half in there just kind of showing the being able to get in and out of it is, you know, an extremely important. All right, so we'll go on to the, the second post play technique here and that's the RVH. So it stands for reverse vertical horizontal. And so what that really means here is if you look at Pecorine there, his post leg is horizontal and his anchor leg is vertical. So taking a step to the next one, the VH, that one is called the vertical horizontal, and that one is actually just flipped of this one. The, the VH vertical horizontal came about first, and then uh, the reverse of that um, was kind of a, a different method and, and kind of played off the VH. That's, that's kind of where the name came from there. Um, the, the big things in this position, it's the importance for our guys of the squareness and flatness. It's not a static position. It's not just go down and, and sit in this position because that's when a lot of guys, you know, run into mistakes and errors, but it's a very active position. We need to be able to hinge back and forth. We need to have awareness of backdoor threats where they are. And our positioning in this position will actually adjust um, based on like, like any other um, position we're in is we'll hinge back and forth, we'll hinge out, we'll get flatter depending on where we need to go. Um, the big things with the RVH is there's actually three different ways to, to connect with the post. There is the skate blade, which Pekka is doing there. There's the toe bridge, which a lot of goaltenders prefer. And then the pad inside, which I believe one of the few guys that uses this in the NHL is Tuka Rask, but he does it very, very well. And we'll, uh, we'll see those in the next slide here. Um, active hands. That's huge for me. Uh, and it, and active hands to me is two ways. It's not just your hands up and active you can actually use active hands to come down and seal holes. So it's always having the awareness of where your hands are, being able to move them up or down, seal holes, catch pucks that come through the zone or come through the crease, uh, lots, of, lots of different elements there. And then stick discipline. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute here, but it's always having an active stick, being able to control your crease, not just setting it in one position and forgetting about it. So here are the three different positions. Uh, we have Ben Bishop on the left-hand side there. He's using the, the toe box or the toe bridge. Uh, and what that really talks about is where he connects with the post. 
This one probably has the best seal on the post other than the, the boot inside. His skate is just on the inside. The post is connecting on that little, um, where our skates tie with the pad. We have that um, two or three inches of lace that guys use, or some guys use the bungees, however they end up working that. Um, and then he'll get a lean and, and whatever side it is, he has his blocker on top or the glove on top of the pad there. The, the top right, like we saw Pekka, he's using skate on post. So the, the drawbacks with skate on post is you, you probably have some of the best movement because your, your skate is able to push off the post, but we also have a hole there, which guys have to be worried about. And that's where we see some of the goals going in is that, uh, that hole we can see above the skate and between the pad. And then the bottom right there, we have Tuka Rask. He's using his, uh, his full boot inside the pad. Um, and, and he does it extremely well and he's able to move in and out of it. Uh, and it's very much personal preference. Um, and you'll see a lot of guys, everyone in the NHL is different. They all have different body types. They all use some variation of, you know, these three methods, but it, it's very much individualized to what your body can do, the way you wear your equipment. And none of them are incorrect ways to do it. It's very uh, what you're comfortable with and what you're, you're able to do. So when do we use the RVH? Um, wraparound situations, low net drives, and it can also be used as a reactionary save from farther out. So you can see in the diagram there, um, lower in the zone towards the bottom of the circle, towards the goal line. Uh, on plays outside of the, the trapezoid, we want our goalies being on their feet as much as possible. But obviously there is a time and the place between inside the trapezoid there behind the net where we do have to go down a little bit earlier, whether we're anticipating kind of a 50-50 puck that might be come out for a wraparound we know the guy is skating behind the net. He's going to come out the other side. There are situations there where you do need to go down a little bit earlier, anticipating and, and reading the, the next play to happen. So we're going to watch some clips here. This first one, we have Cam Johnson. As soon as the puck gets down tight inside the trapezoid there, he does a great job of getting down. You can see from the, the video here, he has a great seal. Cam is a guy that is very good using his toe box. He has a good seal. His glove rests on top. Um, and he's very active and, and what I love is his anchor leg here is always nice and tight. It's able to move him in and out of the post and keeps his stability on the post there. So he makes a save and then immediately we can see him push out of it and gain his feet again right there and he's up. And, that, and that's a big key is whatever position you choose, we need to be able to move into it fluidly and also move out of it, out of it fluidly because there's always a next puck or a rebound that might happen. So that's a great job right there. Next one here, we have Tom McCollum, uh, another USA hockey guy. And this one's a great clip because this is a time where we do need to go down a little bit early. So the puck kind of ends up behind the net here. You can see Tom bump off his post using his window, turn to the other side. This is a 50-50 puck right behind the net. This is a time where I'm fine with my goaltenders being down a little early because if this guys, whether it's coming this way or this way, it, it's hard if you're holding your feet too long, you can get caught down in transition. And it very much depends on the goaltender and how quickly they are able to drop down, but it does pop out. It's still a 50, 50 puck right now. It pops out. Their guy gets a stick on it, wraps it. And again, he makes a save and then he's immediately back up to his feet and does a great job. there, following the play to the next situation. Final one here, we have Ken Appleby. And this one's from a little bit farther out. So I like this play because he does hold his feet. He's looking kind of reading the play. There's no one really out here, but we don't necessarily know what this guy's going to do right now. He could come down this way. He could go up to the net. He ends up throwing it at the net. And as soon as he reads that, you know, he is in a shooting situation right here, Ken's able to drop down his post, make a reactionary uh, RVH save, and he's able to control that rebound and cover it up. So that's a great job of using it from a little bit farther out. So kind of touching back to the stick discipline part, this is a big thing that we talk about with our guys is, and this is kind of a guideline. It is not by any means of this is what you have to do, but we'll see in the next couple of clips here of, you know, this is a, a little tool that we like because using your stick in the RVH position can be a huge tool blocking passing lanes and the same way it is on your feet. So you'll watch UC Saros here, puck goes behind the net. As the puck is behind the goal line, we'll back it up just a little bit right there. His stick is turned over blocking passing lanes. And as soon as the shooter steps in front, he turns it over and he's able to make a nice slide over for that save. So the, the biggest benefits here is we don't want to get caught reaching and, and leaning too far out of a net 
we want to make sure we're controlling that crease, controlling the, the ice around our bot or our, our crease, but, uh, but not overreaching and overgoing for too much. So we'll have a, a couple clips here. This first one's Ken Appleby. Right there, does a great job. His stick is turned over, blocking this passing lane, you know, right out to this guy right through there. As the puck kind of goes out higher here, he ends up turning it over again there, kind of stuffing this shooter into the goal line, into his pad, creating a basically a nothing little shot and makes it a, a nice save on that. So we'll watch it one more time here. Stick is turned over there. Great job. Right here, he does regain his feet for a quick second because that puck's kind of exiting. Does drop down again. You can see his stick is back in the, the kind of save position. He's ready for that shot because it is tight there. Turns it over, makes a save. So that's great. Last one here on the blocker side. This is just doing a good job of controlling the crease. He blocks that pass. It may not have gone to anyone, but it's always good to, to be active, be controlling it. And our guy bumps it back to him for a cover. So that's a, just a great job on uh, a nice little play. So Josh, finally here, we're going into the, the VH. Josh, so, the VH, yeah. I wouldn't mind asking a question from one of the crowd here. And uh, Lee had a really good question about the RVH and was asking, you know, she's heard some different coaches say that after a save, you always want to stand up with the leg that's furthest away from the puck. But when she watches games in the NHL here, she's sorry. Um, it doesn't always, it's not always the case. And is that an error of the NHL goalie or is that, are there different theories to which leg to recover from with the RVH? I think it's very situational. I think whatever you're using, you need to be able to either slide or get back to your feet because if the rebounds, you know, right next to you, you're going to have to do a little slide, a little bump. Um, without seeing the exact situation, it's, it, I don't like to say either way. I think it's just very what you're comfortable with, where the rebound is, and what you need to do next. I think that's going to be very, uh, very deciding of where you have to go and, and what you need to do. More about anticipation of where the play is going to go and less about where the puck is physically at at that moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. I think that's it for the RVH questions. We can move on to the VH. Perfect. So VH, the vertical horizontal. So in this case, Jonathan Quick's post leg is vertical and his back leg is horizontal. Uh, it, it's probably the least used option in today's game, but it absolutely has a time and the place. Um, both of my goaltenders, one, Cam Johnson will, will use it more than Ken Appleby, but uh, it, it's something that Ken does have in his, uh, his arsenal of tools to use when and if he, if he does need it. So the benefits to this, it's a good seal on the post. Um, you have everything covered. Some guys, like you see Quick is, Quick's glove is down. Some guys will bring their glove up. Some guys will wrap it around the post. There are different variations of, of how we can use this. You have the ability to hold your feet longer and react. You can kind of be there waiting on your post. You're able to move off of it, move on to it, and then you're able to drop uh, and seal everything in that manner. It's harder to get back door because you are more square. Your foot's on the post and you're, and you're facing the more of the corner. If that pass does go back door, it's a lot harder to get there. Um, and then many goalies prefer the glove side over the blocker. And it's just very personal of what, uh, what guys like to use in that. Uh, when do we use it? Straight shots with no backdoor option. And, and some guys will use it on net drive situation with a guy driving towards the net. They'll drop the one knee, take the, the short side away and be able to push to, uh, push to the far side. So we'll watch some clips here of it. This one, Cam Johnson, puck goes down right there. You can see him drop into in a VH position just in front of his post, actually, which is freeing up his, his skate blade there to push to the middle. He makes a save here. He slides back to his post into an RVH position, and we're recovering out of it, and he gets back to his feet then. So this is a great job of being able to use both. But again, being able to transition to it, make a save, transition out of it very cleanly. Second one is just a straight shot. So you see the guy driving wide towards the corner. Cam drops into a nice VH position there. He's going to make a, a save with his stick just in front of his pad. And then right here makes another save. And he's, you know, quickly able to transition out of it, make that second save. And then he's, he's following the play up the middle of the ice. So that's another, another very good option right there. Then finally here, this is Ken Appleby. And this is a, a unique clip because Ken Appleby is a you know, very, very different goal than Cam Johnson. Ken's a lot bigger. He's not quite as good of a skater. Um, Cam is very athletic, very mobile down low. So 
we'll watch the clip here once. And when, when Ken Appleby throws the VH here, I remember talking to him after the game and the next day when we're going over a video is it surprised me. I, it, it was a, a play that I didn't believe that he, it wasn't a, a tool that I believed he had. And when he was able to throw it right here, you can see him drop the VH position. He's taking away everything short side right now, really only giving this shooter one option to try to cut to the middle here on him. And he's loaded. He pushes to the middle, makes a nice save, makes a second save, and then he's competing down low right there. So it's awesome. And, and for him to be able to use that tool is just a perfect example of why we need to practice all of them. You know, he, he had the ability to throw it when he needed to. And if we, we back up to right about here, what we talked about is if he's still holding his feet, maybe in a little farther back, it becomes really hard right here to, to drop down in that butterfly or also push to the middle because he is driving in quick. So he, he does a great job of kind of manipulating the player and forces him to do what, you know, Ken wants him to do. And then he just takes it away and, you know, kudos to him to, to have that in his toolbox to be able to pull out there. So finally here, uh, it's just our, our keys, you know, and it's, you know, it's your ability to trust yourself, be decisive, and the urgency. Um, taking charge of the play, knowing what you want to do in certain situations, and, and that comes from practice. Being able to, to do all the different positions um, and, the ability, and the ability to move in and out of it is huge. That's the biggest thing to me is you have to be able to get into the positions, you have to be able to get out of them, and you have to be able to uh, control, the, control the ice around your crease there. So this is... Uh, a couple of clips here. The biggest thing I want to stress is goals will happen. And like we talked about earlier is all of these situations here, to me, it's not using the wrong save selection. I believe they played them the right way, but they didn't execute properly. And that's where these goals have gone in. And, and this is where the post play can get a bad name is we just didn't do what we wanted to do, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have them play these situations differently. And it's just unfortunate that, you know, these pucks did go in this way. Watch it one more time here. Anything to add, guys, before we uh, move on there? Yeah, I mean, I just think this reminds me so much of a very common error that we see in youth hockey, you know, probably all levels of hockey and, and practice. And, you know, like right here, he executes probably not as well as he would like to, but made the right read. And if he executed properly, that's probably hundred percent. He's going to make that save every time. And, and what it reminds me of is in practice where we see a lot of coaches that say, you know, like Timmy, you butterfly and they shot high. I want you to stay on your feet every single shot, this drill. I don't want you to butterfly ever again because you've been butterflying too much. And, and, and correct me if you think differently, but in my mind, what we're doing is we're eliminating the thinking part. Really that's what we're trying to develop here is reading, react to the play and then execute. And if we're asking our kids to stay on their feet every single shot, then we're not teaching them to read the release and butterfly when it is appropriate and stay on your feet when appropriate. And similarly with our post play, if we're saying, you know, you let in a terrible RVH goal in overtime and we lost the game. I don't want you to ever use an RVH again. I want you to use a different save selection. That was terrible. You know, are we really teaching them to read and react to the play or are we just creating kind of ultimatums based upon a one instance that may not even have been the wrong one? Yeah, absolutely. So this is my call to action. Uh, we need to practice all four. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we need to practice the overlap. We, we need to practice the RVH. Practice, you know, using your toe, your toe bridge, your boot. Um, practice your VH. And also practice holding your feet. Because there is a time and a place that we, we do need to do that. So, and, and that comes in practice. And it's creating game situations and reads in practice. Because it's one thing to be able to do one of these positions properly in a goalie skate when it's very controlled, when there's just one shooter or, you know, a shot from one situation and you know, what's going to happen. But the, the sign that a goaltender, you know, say Ken throwing the VH in a situation like that in a game, when we really hadn't practiced that is his confidence in himself to that. He knows he can throw whatever tool he needs in that situation, in the game. And that's huge. And that, and that's understanding himself and, and understanding his game and, it's being adaptable. Um, if something isn't working, try something else. You don't have to be super rigid because your goalie coach told you this is the way you should play this situation. If it's not working for you, try to find a solution. You know, find something different uh, and be yourself. Don't uh, don't just do a post play selection because your favorite goaltender 
in the NHL uses it, or you saw some on TV or goalie coach says it, be who you are. And like I said, with my two goaltenders is Ken Appleby and Cam Johnson are very, very different people and very different goaltenders. If they tried to play like each other, it wasn't going to work for, for one of them. So it's very, very good to see that, you know, it, different tools and different selections are successful. It's just being yourself and you don't have to play a single way to have success in hockey. Hey, Josh, can you talk a little bit more about, I know Ken and Cam had different heights and uh, a coach on YouTube asked, how much of, of a factor is height going to be in safe selection in these scenarios? For instance, Nashville has two goalies on the extreme opposites of height. Yes. So it, it's going to depend on how you play. Like Cam Johnson will use the overlap a lot longer uh, than Ken, Ken Appleby will. Ken will, is able to use his RVH earlier because he has the size and the coverage to do that. But I believe both goaltenders and, and Cam's right about six foot. Ken is uh, six, four, six, five. And both goaltenders are able to execute all the different post play techniques. Cam isn't able to use the RVH as early as Ken is. So Cam Johnson, you know, is dropping to the RVH because he has to when it's tight little wraps and, and close to the net, but he's going to favor the overlap in certain situations. And I think that's where it comes in is knowing yourself, knowing your size and your limitations. And you have to create a game plan for what works for you. If you are 5'10 or, or smaller, you're not going to be able to sit in your RVH when the puck's on the outside near the half wall. You, you are going to give up some holes. Vice versa, Ken Appleby or a guy like Ben Bishop, they're able to use it earlier because they have the size to, to use that in that situation. You guys have anything to, to add to that? No, I, I think that really makes a lot of sense and definitely answers the question. And, uh, you know, I think this page that you have this call to action, you hit so many good points on it, right? Like you, you hit on practicing different techniques. You hit on, you know, creating those game situations and being adaptable and being about your, being about um, being yourself. Like, you know, if, if our goalies, parents or our coaches, you know, you take this and anything they do, I mean, that's, those are some gold moments, gold, golden nuggets that you can be. I really like be adaptable, you know, like that's cool. You know, like it's, really kind of hits home. Steve, you have anything? Yeah, just the size piece, it really hits home with youth hockey as well. And Josh, I know that you've had the opportunity to work on not only the pro side, but also the youth side of the game. And one thing that I see often is depending upon what area of the country we're in and who the NHL goalie happens to be in that market, that determines how most of those kids play. And so when we're in the LA area, we have a lot of Jonathan Quicks out there, regardless of their height and, and their age and all of that. Um, Billy asks a really good question about hip durability and wear and tear on young goalies with the RVH. And then I think on top of that question, um, he's asking, you know, is there value to them staying on their feet, not only for mobility, but also for some hip health and some things that we do need to be aware of as coaches? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's something that does need to be practiced, but I think you have to draw the fine line of what is enough and what is, um, and I guess in the pro scenarios, what is going to get them the reps that they need to feel sharp and be able to, to perform at the, the level that they need to, but where's the, the line of rest? And you have to you know, walk that. And especially for kids, it shouldn't be something that they are working on you know, exclusively in practice for hours and hours and hours. It's a tool, but there are a lot of other tools in their toolbox. So it is a, you know, it, it, that's a hot topic of how much is too much, but it, it should be, it needs to be practiced, but there needs to be that line of, you know, we're working on, on everything and it's keeping them healthy. And, and especially, you know, over the course of a long season is durability is huge. If our goaltender is in the stands because he's hurt, he's not able to, to be in the net and make saves and, and help our team win. So that's a, that's a huge factor that we need to, to talk about. Yeah. And I would say it's another great reason to use intermediate nets as well. I know that we get the argument all the time that if the goalie is three feet tall, then they probably shouldn't be in an RVH. But when you have a 10 U goalie in the intermediate net, that RVH save selection looks pretty darn close to what you see an NHL goalie looking like. And, and they do now have pegs in place for those um, intermediate nets, which allow them to stay in place and the goalies to work on some of these different techniques. Um, and then Josh, I'm not sure. I know I've had some coaches that I've run into that have kind of tried the abstinence approach and they're like, don't use this until you're, you know, 16 years old because you know, you're not big enough to use the safe selection yet. And, and from my experience, 
the goalies watch YouTube, they watch the NHL, they, they watch their heroes. And regardless of coaches saying, hey, like, don't try that like yet, you're not old enough. Sure enough, the first thing they want to do is put on their, you know, LA Kings jersey and, and be Jonathan Quick out there. And that's what we love about this game. Why on earth would we want to hinder their ability to be their hero? I mean, that's the reason we all start, the, the, you know, the game. To that point, have you seen some changes in, in Florida goalies with Bazzi and now Bob? Is is that changed a little bit of the style, or how's that been from your perspective? A little bit, I, especially with Vazzy and you know the success that Tampa has had recently. And in our area is is more so um, Tampa fans than this Florida. There are some, but it, a lot of a lot of Vazzy fans, and and you see kids they want to, and, and Vasilevsky is a, a very unique goaltender. He's large, he's super athletic, he's flexible. There's so many tools that he has. So I, I do see goaltenders, you, you try, they're trying to emulate him. And there are times that they're emulating things in the wrong situation. And I think that's where just, you know, teaching is a, Hey, like, yes, this is a great tool, but we need to use it in the right situation. You know, we need to use it when the puck is, you know, being in a wraparound. And, and that was a, a point for, you know, younger goalies is at every level, wraparounds and, and low plays happen so absolutely we need to have tools to be able to handle wraparounds and being able to get into your post whether it's a technically perfect rvh no but you need to be able to you know seal the post and make a save and then also be able to get out of it and that's a huge thing is we don't want goaltenders just working on one half of it you need to be able to slide make a save or, or go down and also be able to get up or slide out of that and and move to the next situation i think your last slide here brings up another great point you, you mentioned create game situations and reads in practice and Kevin McLaughlin touched on this point on Monday about our activity tracker through our mobile coach app that coaches can use to track what do our practices actually look like and through our experience of using that app and I challenge all the coaches and parents that are on here if you know if you're a goalie parent use that app and track where are shots coming from practice if you're a coach you know maybe assign one of the parents to do this or an assistant coach but what you're going to find, it doesn't matter what level it's at, is that traditionally all of our practices are structured so that the shots are taken from the house. It's almost a, a linear progression, and then all of a sudden the shot's taken from right in front of the net, and the goalie competes and, and does this thing. But when we're wondering why we don't have more success probably on some of these wraparound or bad angle shots, we might need to look in the mirror as coaches and recognize how many of the drills that we've designed in practice will create a game situation where there's a wraparound or a shot from a bad angle. And uh, Josh, have you seen any of that on your side from youth hockey practice, even in pro, has that been a, a mindful approach that you all have had is to make sure that we have some different scenarios in practice that simulate some of these situations in games? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like every, at all levels is when you're doing a flow drill, guys want to naturally creep into, you know, the slot and shoot from, from right down the slot. Cause that's where they know they can score. So it, and unfortunately at all levels, that's going to happen, but it, it, in front of the goalies, you have to, you know, stick to what you're doing and, and focus maybe a little less on trying to stop every puck, but do what you need to do to be successful in games. But it, you know, it is something that we've worked on on the other side of it is, you know, we have to, we have to practice things to be successful then in the game. So in, in practices, you know, game situations is, you know, how many shots do we face with a guy with his head up from the red line walking into the slot? Not very many. So all those other little things that happen in a game, whether it's wraparounds, it's a guy driving wide for a shot off the pad, it's low to high plays. There's so many other things. And, and with us, with the Everblades, our head coach, Brad Ralph, does a, a great job of incorporating everything. We have, the, the, we have great you know, goalie warm-up drills. We have flow drills for the players to establish speed and pace and, and get them their reps. And we do game situations. We do in zone. We do, um, he does a lot of drills that combine things. So whether it's a, uh, a regroup into an end zone, spot another puck, regroup for a line rush. You know, so many different things. And I think that's great for the goalies because they see all of those different situations in practice and they're able to do it. And obviously at, you know, as fast as we, we do practice at a really good pace. So that pace in practice is very close to what they see in a game. And that gives them confidence to work on things in practice. And then they feel the confidence in a game to be able to execute what they need to do when they, they see those situations again. Yeah, and it's great to hear that they're doing that in practice because I think, again, for all of our goalie coaches that are out there, there's a very big difference when you're in your little facility doing your lesson with your goalie with you as the shooter from when they're on their team practice with the stress of their peers shooting the puck, you know, the, the actual shot coming from a relative age shot. 
you know, that's going to be a much different development environment than when it's the quiet space. We're doing a bunch of reps of the same thing over and over again. And, and I don't think that's enough. You know, certainly it's important for us to have the block training in our facilities, doing our goalies training stuff, but it's got to happen in the team practice as well. If they're really going to adapt to that environment, which is, you know, their age players and, and that practice structure. Um, another thing I want to touch on is kind of, our ADM model in small areas that we end up having, we have a lot of station-based training now in our youth hockey practice. And, and that creates another huge challenge for us as coaches to have a wraparound when you only have an eighth of the ice and you've got eight to 10 different stations going around the rink, you know, you're almost forced to only shoot the puck from the slot because the slot's really the only available space to shoot from. So um, I would challenge again, your coaches, the, the coaches, the net doesn't always have to face out front. You can rotate the net and maybe flip it to facing the boards. Now you have the same small area space, but now it's a wraparound instead of just a traditional shot from the slot. Josh or Dave, do you either have any other examples or recommendations for ways that we can structure practices to start to create more of these post practices that we need to see? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's adaptability. Like, you know, it, it's, you know, talking to the goaltenders and, and what I like to do with our guys and, and even the youth kids is, you know, ask them, say, Hey, is, is there something that you feel like you need to work on? You know, and if they don't feel comfortable saying and work in that, but the, I think in Florida, we're doing a very good job. And, and there's some coaches like Ryan Brimley with his Southeast elite stuff. And they're, they're, they're following the ADM, you know, method and, and doing a great job like that, but we're, we're adapting things. We're looking at the, the ice surface and looking at the different drills and, and we're trying to, and, and, and I've talked to them about it, especially for the, the goaltending standpoint is how can we, you know, hit different things. So if we have goaltenders at three or four different stations, let's see if we can have a wraparound situation. Let's have whatever, if they want to work on a breakaway station, we have a breakaway, we have a, a small battle game and whatever that is, is just varying what all the players see. Cause I think it's great for all of them is they need to be able to play in all the situations. Cause that's what we want. We have them, you know, playing in, in breakaways and down low and compete and, and all those little, all those little areas of the game. Yeah, and that's the beauty of this goaltending stuff. I know that we label it goalie week or goalie day of the week, but realistically, this is a chess match. And, you know, my brother was a forward. We went to all my goalie clinics and ended up learning so much about how to score based upon learning about the position of goal. And I, I think this is another great example of that, where if we want our forwards to learn how to score in wraparounds or bad angle shots, then we probably need to make sure that they also are getting those reps. So as much as we're stressing today that this is important for the goalie to learn, you know, it's really important for the entire team. We all need to be able to adapt to all these different environments. And I think this is one great way to do that for sure. Are there any other thoughts, Dave or Josh, you have on post play in general? Um, again, everybody on the crowd, if you have any questions, please throw them in there. But I think this has been pretty, pretty great today. Appreciate hey, it. Josh, I, 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 you said something earlier about reactionary RVH. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what that entails and why that's important? Yeah, so I, I think it's important is not like a static position. We aren't just going down and sealing holes as there, there's other elements to it. So if the puck is farther out, we can still drop into that position. And if it, you know, let's say it's on your blocker side, you, you drop into that position, but your glove comes up and catches a puck. You, you can scoop it in front of your pad. Um, and, it, and like I said earlier, is there's a difference with active hands is you, your hands can be up and active, but they can also be sealing a hole. And that is still active hands because you're actively moving them because you know that puck is going to come to that hole or you know that hole is there. And it's being able to adjust out of it is if you make a save and you know the puck moves a little bit, we have to adjust. We have to move our hands. We have to move our body. We're not just, this is our RVH position. We sit here and hope the puck hits us. Maybe except if you're Ben Bishop, then you can just sit there. But, you know, it's about that size, too, like what you talked about, Ken and Cam. Ken can go in there a little bit sooner because of his size. And I think that's the important part. I really like that reactionary RVH and then how you're stressing the getting in and getting out quickly and fluidly. I think that's a big component of using these effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever, whatever situation it is and, and position we're in as goaltender, we have to be able to move into it and we have to get out of it because it's not just a one shot and done you make a save, whether you control the rebound or not, you have to go somewhere else. And we have to be able to do that, you know, at the pace of the play and, and control and control what we're doing around the net. Taking it back a little bit to what we talked about at the start with the kind of the RVH fails piece. And again, our role models being the NHL for most of our goalies that are watching this, uh, you know, 
I would say that when we're watching this often at the highest levels, there are a lot of goalies that just hang out in the RVH and the puck can be on the half wall behind the board. Sometimes I even see it at the point where the goalie is still just sitting in their RVH. You know, is do you have any suggestions for how we can help fix that? Or, or are they actually playing in a position that we find successful just for the position that they're in at that size? Yeah, it, it's just very dependent. It, it's, you know, who you are. Can, can you have success like this? Can it, and it, and sometimes you just need to learn is all right in practice or a game is if you get scored on, it's a learning point. You know, maybe I couldn't do it here and, and maybe I don't have the size to, to drop quite yet. But a lot of the, the goaltenders I work with will, will work on, you know, kind of game mapping and, and identifying is, you know, with my size, this is an area that I know I can get down and, and have coverage. And, and I know when the puck isn't here yet, I have to, you know, maybe be in a, an over an over overlap position or, or do something else. And it, it's just knowing who you are and really learning what you can and can't do. And that just comes through practice and trial and error. And yeah, great example there with Ken, right? The same concept and watching him kind of adapt to, to his size and his game and throwing out a couple different options that maybe even surprised you as a coach at times. Yeah, absolutely. He, it, it's knowing that he, he can use it if he has to. And that was a perfect situation where that was the appropriate, you know, play there. And he was able to do it because he had the confidence he's practiced it. And he knew that, Hey, I'm going to do this. I can do it. And he's, he went with it and it worked out great. So that's perfect. Awesome. Well, I don't think we're, it looks like we might have one more question here from our YouTube channel. Luke is asking thoughts on goalies throwing stand-up saves on the post such as an old school stand-up pad stack? I think there's a time and the place for everything. It's just totally dependent on, you know, what happens. And if you're standing in an overlap or on your post and the guy shoots it from far out and, you know, it's high, we don't have to drop. We can stand there and make a glove save or a blocker save. There's absolutely no reason to, to have to go down if we don't have to. And if you have it in your ability to, to stand there and trust that you can make a save on your feet, great and it's just you know comes the ability to be able to execute and control the rebound and and all the things that that falls and and some of the top goalies ever the elite goalies have that unpredictability to them so sometimes they might come and you you take a shot one way and they're going to stand up the next time they might do the rvh you know depending on different situations and i think that's an important part to have those different techniques that you can employ you know given your your checklist um did you want to talk about your Ken Appleby case study? Yeah, absolutely. As long as you guys are right for it. All right. So part two here. Um, I know we, we've talked about Ken quite a bit now. He's 6'4". He has long limbs. And the biggest thing when he got to us, he was very uncomfortable um, moving from toe box or pad inside. And you can see in his RVH position there um, next to the, the post uh, inside his pad, or even that little hole between his pants and his glove, that there are some holes there. So he wasn't sealing and executing to the level that he wanted to. Um, and we talked about a, a bunch of other different tools, whether he wanted to go boot inside, whether he wanted to go toe bridge on side. We talked about it all and he was very, very open and, and wanting to find a solution. But he, when we practiced it, he wasn't comfortable in those situations. Like he, he couldn't execute to the level that he wanted to. And we didn't necessarily have the time in, in the pro hockey season where you, you are limited on practice time. You're playing a lot of games with travel is to completely retool what he does. So we had to find a solution for him that was one going to work and make him feel comfortable, but also be able to execute and, and play the game at the level that we needed him to. So this is a video of him before uh, one of the first couple of days of training camp. And you can see just right here as the puck gets passed down, the, all the drill is the shooter over here can either step above the glove and pass back door to me or just take a quick little stuff right here, just a, a quick little drill we're doing before our team practice. So you can see our shooter there. He doesn't end up scoring uh, on any of these clips, but I thought it's a, a great visual of, you know, what the net is available right there. And you see there's a big hole right here. There's a hole right here. But obviously Ken is a very large goaltender, so everything up high is, you know, he's, he's taking that away. And this clip right here, you can see how well he does move from a skate on post position. He passes across. He's right there. And again, like we stress, he's right back to his feet right away. And we'll watch the, the last one right here. Back into it. Save. Follows the rebound. 
everything's great right there. So what we ended up actually doing is he goes skate on post, but we turned his glove hand over. And instead of setting it on top of the, the pad, like a lot of goaltenders will do, we almost made a cupping um, form over top of the edge of his pad and where his skate is. So by doing this, he sealed the, the pad and the, the skate on post hole. The back end of his glove near the cuff seals that little hole near his pants, but it also allowed him to be able to be in that skate on post position and move out of it. So it was a, a great little adjustment. And my first question to him is when, when anyone turns their hand over like that, I, I asked him, is it, do you feel like your glove is going to be exposed or the backhand of your glove and hurt your fingers? And, and what we actually ended up finding out is I tossed a pile of pucks near uh, the goal line and, and kind of started shooting them half speed to make sure I wasn't going to be the one that hurt him. But I was hitting the, the back end of his glove where the, the pocket is, where you can kind of see there is most exposed. And it, it was never an issue. And he was very, very confident to, to go into this position um, near the net and on a close range plays. And um, it was a, a very good adjustment once, uh, once we kind of dialed it in and, and he had the confidence to, to use it right away. So we'll see some, some different clips here. All this one is, is the puck kind of going low. You can see Ken drops into it great there. And you can see the coverage on the, the video as best as you can here is, you know, the glove is turned over. Everything on the short side, those holes are all sealed. Oops, we'll go back to that one. And right there, he's down into it, save, save again, and then he's moving right out of it. So that's great. We'll watch it one more time there. And that's awesome. So second one here has a couple different elements. He drops into it right there. Stick does turn over, like we talked about when the player does start coming into the net. Wrap around, he gets over, makes a save. He bumps in, bumps out, and he's constantly moving like we talked about. He's not just sitting there on his post. He's moving in, out. He's adjusting to what's happening. He throws a little poke there. He's back into his post. Puck goes this way, and he comes back over to it. This one right here, this, this was also a question. And yes, he can have coverage. Yes, he can move out of it. But what happens if the play breaks down a little bit and he needs to turn that glove over and use it? So this was a great clip that we found was the puck is going to come behind the net over here. And this guy behind the net is actually going to come out and pass it back out this way. So we'll see what happens here as he turns. And right there, he's, he is able to, to move his glove back and it's not locked up on top of his, of his pad. And he's able to make a nice save there. And then the clip, the clip just kind of continues on to another, another good seal, another good stick. And he's out over there. So we'll watch that one one more time here. He turns. And right here, he has the ability to throw his glove, make a really good save on a, a tough little read there, and does a great job. And then and finally here, the last clip is he has the ability to lean and take everything away. So he does a good active stick right there. He has it sealed. And then you can see right here, I'll back up just so we can see it happen quick. He squares himself up. He leans into that pulse, taking absolutely everything away. And this guy has you know absolutely nothing to shoot at. And uh, he ended up actually controlling that rebound up in, up in the, the collarbone neck area there as well. So it does a great job kind of adapting and it's not that stuck position. So that's, uh, that's all I got for that. Awesome, that was a great representation of a lot of things we got to talk about today. <laughs> yeah, other thanks guys. I, I thought that was really good. I think, you know, the whole important points for all our coaches, players and parents you know, is to make sure that this is a save and make sure we're trying to do it as best we can. But it's also just one in the toolbox of many saves. And like you said, like people overuse it. It's getting in and out quickly, using it as reactionary. And that's something that we want to do and uh, make sure our goalies do. So. And coaches, now you know what it stands for. So no more cop outs. I don't know what the VHR is, so I'm not even going to try it. So and, uh, Josh, thanks. Okay. If anybody asks, asks us, I'm just going to say, watch Josh Robinson's webinar. You know, right. he... <laughs> Awesome. Well, Josh, I really thank you again for uh, putting your time and effort into this. This was an excellent presentation. And um, coaches out there, please share this with your peers, with your goalie parents and your goalies to make sure we solve some of these post-play myths and, and educate our kids on exactly uh, the creativity and, and the thought process that we want behind some of these different plays that happen on the ice. 
Hey, Josh, do you want to um, leave with anybody one last message for the, the people watching and listening? Yeah, it's, it's just practice everything, you know, be you. There's no, there's no one way to do it. Um, there, there's so many different ways to, to make saves in the game. And you look at the NHL on any given night, there's Jonathan Quick, there's Ben Bishop, there's Corey Schneider, Ryan Miller, just everyone is different. So that, that's the biggest thing is you, you won't see two copies of each other in the NHL. So by no means should there be copies of, you know, kids growing up and from all the way up and, you know, be you and figure out what works and what doesn't work for you. And at the end of the day, if you stop the puck and you have fun and that's the, that's the number one thing. That's really good. And, and I, I really enjoyed listening to you because within your presentation about talking about all this technical stuff, you can hear how much you are, you are putting into the goalies and the communication piece, you know, asking questions and, you know, getting their feedback and you could, I could hear it. You know, I think that's a really important part too. So um, just want to remind everybody tomorrow we have the Eves family, Mike Eves, who has coached many different levels from NHL down to, um, junior hockey to division three to division one um, with his whole family. So his wife, Beth will be on as well as, as, as well as his two kids, Ben and Patrick. So I think it's going to be a really interesting talk and, you know, having um, mama, mama Eve's on there. I think it's going to really um, she, just by talking to them, she was, she was the rock. She was the one that made everything work about having a dad, in the coaching world and um, what a great family and what a great talk we're going to have tomorrow. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Josh. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow.